Okay, Tony, if you, if you want to maybe start, we have 133 people already. Okay. Well, hello and good afternoon, everyone. Thank you for finding time to join us today. Uh, my name is Anthony Fierro, and I'm the Executive Director of Facility Services for Nassau BOCES. Uh, for those of you who are not from the New York area, uh, BOCES stands for the Board of Cooperative Educational Services. And Nassau BOCES is a local educational agency located here on Long Island, and we provide shared educational programs and services to the 56 districts in Nassau County. So today we're very excited to welcome all of you to the first of a three-part webinar series. Uh, the series topics will focus on school planning and design for COVID-19. And today's webinar is hosted by Nassau BOCES, AIA Long Island, and AIA Northern Virginia. It's titled, A New Frontier for School Planning, Design for Resiliency, Safety, and Well-Being in the Wake of COVID-19. Uh, but before we get started with the presentation, I'd like to just take a moment to share the concept behind this webinar series. Uh, so even before the COVID-19 pandemic began, school planning and design uh, we're really at a crossroads. Here on Long Island, school renovations were on the rise due in part to aging school buildings. And following COVID-19, it became even more important than ever for us to re-examine the physical environment that we're providing for the learning. So what makes this webinar series different? Well, <clears throat> this webinar series provides an opportunity for design professionals and the educational community to work collaboratively to explore emerging design trends for schools, particularly since the COVID-19 pandemic. And what makes this webinar series unique is not only the distinguished presenters that we've assembled, but equally as important is the input we receive from all of you, the participants. So our audience today includes a wide cross-section of the stakeholders in education. Along with architects and engineers, we have school board members, we have district superintendents, business officials, facilities directors. We also have teachers, parents. We have some students and college professors as well as other school administrators. Uh, in addition to this live event, we're making these webinars available to several universities to introduce students to the school design field, uh, potentially even as a career path. So together, we'll have a conversation to examine the opportunities, the strategies, um, and the challenges we now face in school design, both in the short and the long term. Uh, and to initiate that conversation, we had sent out a thought exchange question in advance of this webinar uh, that many of you participated in, and we thank you for that. Um, our presenters plan to share the results of those responses during uh, today's session. So your input here is so important. Um, collectively, we can start examining new educational models that could impact school design for future generations. And our hope is that this webinar series can serve as a springboard and a forum to accomplish that goal. So before we start today's presentation, we have several introductions. And first up, I'd like to introduce uh, Graciela Carrillo, president of the Long Island chapter of the American Institute of Architects. So Graciela. Thank you, Tony. Hi everyone and welcome to our event. Um, I'm very happy to collaborate with NASA BOSIS and AIA Northern Virginia on putting together this important event that as Tony just mentioned is, is very important for educators, architects, engineers, and everyone that is involved in the planning and design of schools. So now I would like to welcome Joseph McCoy. Thank you, Graciela. Um, as you heard, my name is Joseph McCoy. I'm president of the Northern Virginia chapter of American Institute of Architects. And I wanted to say thanks again to Graciela and the other organizers of this event for extending the invitation to our chapter to partner with you. Um, as we all know, adapting to restrictions of a pandemic like this has certainly disrupted the way we're all doing things. But uh, one side benefit, of course, is that uh, geographic and other kinds of boundaries um, fade away in a virtual format. And um, we have the opportunity to partner in ways that we might not have done in the past. Um, I will now pass the mic over to Anthony Fierro. Okay, uh, thank you, Joseph. Uh, now I'd like to invite uh, Dr. Robert Dillon, our NASA BOCES District Superintendent, to 
introduce our next guest. Thank you very much, Tony. And I want to thank uh, our participants for attending today and our colleagues who put this together. I find it very interesting when Tony first came to me with this concept, it was uh, pre-virus and we had meetings in our, in our boardroom and we talked about the traditional type of conference where you would come with workshops and we would interact and intermingle, but obviously the world has changed. Now, we have an opportunity here, as, as we mentioned before, an opportunity to create a new norm. So it's very, that part is very exciting and uh, we can't change what happened. We can only look forward. And that's part of the purpose of this particular webinar is to look forward on how we bring the, the best facilities given the conditions that we have. It's my pleasure to introduce our speaker from the New York State Education Department, Dr. Christina Coughlin. Uh, Dr. Coughlin has been with the New York State Education Department for seven years. Uh, prior to that, she was on the dark side. She was from the Division of Budget, the people who control the purse strings. So she's come over and she shared the bag of tricks that she learned there. You know, but she's more than just, you know, a person in Albany. I found her to be uh, a very reflective practitioner. She's very student focused. Uh, one of the best things uh, is that she's available. And you can't say that quite often about people in bureaucracies. She's very available to us. You call, she answers. Uh, she's very communicative. She's very transparent and dedicated uh, like I said earlier, to the children. She has demonstrated scholarship in, in, her, in her studies, and she truly uh, brings more, the most important thing, uh, she's a mom, and she brings that to the job, and I thank her for that. And I promised I wouldn't talk about her championship beer pong or the fact that she was a karaoke queen in Chicago. We leave that there, which happened in Chicago, we leave in Chicago. But she's a great person and a, really a strong advocate for what we do. Uh, Dr. Coughlin, Christina. Thank you very much, Bob. Uh, he's lying about the beer pong, by the way. <laughs> I'm really bad at it. Uh, thank you all very much for having me here today. Um, and, and I'm glad, I'm really looking forward to listening in. I'm, the department, you know, even prior to the pandemic, was starting to think about uh, how instructional spaces needed to change uh, to address the way kids are learning today. And you know that's that has um, implications for design and fire code and and state aid that are really complicated. And um, we had kind of just started our initial thoughts on that, and then the pandemic hit, and here we are in another place entirely. And space will be looking different, I think, after this. So, you know, we we don't have any answers yet, but I did want to participate today and uh, assure you that this is going to be a thoughtful process. Knowing state ed, I think you can all be, um, we won't be surprised to know that it'll probably be a slow process, but you know, good deliberation takes a while. <laughs> so, um, what, you know, our intention is to do some updates of our, we've been working for a while on updates of our internal systems and our internal practice with regards to, um, you know, look, the way we look at projects and the, and the speed with which we're able to review them. But then after that, the next step is going to be looking at, um, what schools look like and how they're designed and how the design impacts the learning. So um, I'm really looking forward to the rest of the conference today and thank you. Thank you, Dr. Christina Coughlin for joining us today. It was an honor to have you opening the series of webinars for us. Now let me introduce you to our speakers. Uh, Tracy Graham is a senior healthcare consultant at Hoard Copland Match, located in Alexandria, Virginia. Tracy is a licensed nurse practitioner with an MBA in management and change and a doctorate in nursing that focuses in design thinking methodology for facility planning with a foundation in process of systems redesign. And we also have uh, Janine Kotop, AIA. She is a school safety specialist at Hort Copland Match, also in Alexandra, Virginia. And Janine is a project architect with over 10 years of experience in education projects. She serves at, at, as HCM's in-house school safety and security specialist and is recognized nationally for her work on the issue. In 2020, she was named the inaugural Citizen Architect of the Month by the AIA American Institute of Architects. 
Um, after the presentations by Tracy and Janine, we will have some time to, res to respond to questions. Uh, please send them over through the Q&A box, which is at the bottom of, of your screen. Um, just want to let you know that we are recording this session. If we run out of time and some of the questions cannot be addressed, we will be responding them in writing and posting them along with the, with the webinar uh, in our websites in AIA Long Island, Nassau Bosis, and also AIA Northern Virginia. So please, uh, Tracy, I'm gonna, I'm gonna uh, pass it on to you, thank you. Thank you, can you hear me? I just, can you yeah. hear me okay? Yes, sure. we can hear you. Thank you everybody um, for inviting me. Uh, my name is Tracy Graham. I'm a healthcare strategist. In fact, I'm a planning strategist at Hoyt Copeland Mock and I do come with 35 years of experience, not just in, in um, nursing, but in disaster management and um, emergency preparedness. It's a great passion of mine. Um, I actually have completed several years of doing uh, continuity of operations planning for facilities and organizations worldwide. Um, I'm really pleased to be here today to talk to you uh, a little bit about uh, resiliency and sustainability and what's possible maybe in education. Um, I think it's really important that I, I understand that we have such an eclectic group here that you all have unique and very important roles in and that we really value in design thinking. So we're going to talk a little bit about why we're all here, uh, a little bit about what's happened with COVID and education, some of the next steps in disaster preparedness and response. How do we think about helping um, organizations become resilient? So because you, you've all got eclectic roles, think about it within your own role. So even if we talk about something that may be operational, how does that impact space or design? Um, and we'll talk a little bit about the elements of continuity of operations planning and resiliency planning. Again, there's some really key specific uh, focuses, both for architecture and engineering, but especially for um, the administrators and, and folks we have in the education uh, continuum here today. You're all extremely important in, in, um, in playing a role in, in helping all of us become resilient. The learning, or learning objectives, pardon me, that we had put out for this that include both for myself and Janine um, are that you can leave here understanding the essential elements of a continuity operations plan along with the methods to sustain business resiliency while planning for reconstitution in the future. Um, we'll discuss interpretation and implementation of the AIA's reopening tool and how it can be used on a local level for school projects um, under, and help you understand what infrastructural changes could be implemented in order to safely reopen schools while maintaining spatial distancing. And together we'll all reflect and analyze and plan for the art of possible with considerations for both the short-term urgency and the need to design uh, with the new challenges and opportunities of COVID and not just COVID but with transition in mind. So why are we here? Um, we are in unprecedented times and the Hort Copeland Mock team has worked diligently with thought leaders like yourselves to adapt and execute uh, the development of reimagined methodology to facilitate design um, that also includes continuity of operations planning, every constitution planning for learning organizations. We're all committed to our community's resiliency and our commitment is solidified by ongoing research, daily assessments of local, national and global impacts and opportunities for a client. I actually attend um, and keep my finger on the pulse of what's happening with the CDC and World Health Organization at least uh, every second day, if not every day, just to see what's happening and how they could potentially impact ourselves and our clients. Our goal is to offer a range of opportunities for us to really think um, and have thoughts for discussion and offer a podium to discover what is possible moving forward for all of us and our clients. Again, um, we're hoping that there's a lot of comments and as much as, as questions at the end, just so that we can get everybody's thoughts and ideas and lessons that you've learned. COVID in education. So following an emergency or disaster, communities expect their schools to be operational. Healthcare organizations uh, are to provide medical care to the injured and we expect our infrastructures to be readily available. And often, however, our organizations um, have not really thought about how they're going to move forward when their own staff have been impacted or are victims of a disaster or pandemic. So we really need to be prepared and help provide educational um, providers and those uh, that are providing education opportunities to think um, in the future. And the picture in the background here is really interesting. It actually is a class taught outside of Boston University in 1918 um, during the Spanish flu. So what we know is, is that this is not new. Uh, it's just different. 
COVID-19, we know, first presented itself in De uh, December 8th in Hunan City in, in China. It's spread nearly across every country of the globe in just under nine months. It's really quite daunting. It's overturned daily lives, shattered businesses and schools, and disrupted the world's economy. We know more about um, COVID-19 than we probably have of other pandemics because of our access to media and information. However, we need to understand that COVID has also uh, infected more than 33 million people worldwide and has killed at least a million people. And I believe that that toll is likely to be far greater than our official tallies will ever know. The interesting thing and potentially the sad thing about all of this is the World Health Organization on Monday put out a situation report that showed that there was nearly 2 million new cases, um, the largest number of reported cases in a week since the ap uh, epidemic began. We know that with COVID, um, the chain of infection is important, especially in education, that we had to have a source. In Hunan City, it started, uh, like we said, in the live markets, whether or not it was a rat or a bat, we're not quite 100% convinced, but it, it certainly uh, entered a reservoir source of a human. And in that, the difference between COVID and, and prior SARS is that it mutated. We know that the portal of expert, uh, exit probably was secretion or excretion and droplets had a portal of entry and usually we see our susceptible hosts being um, the most vulnerable. Again, not much different, but what is different and not new is the history of closing of, of schools because of ep epidemic states back nearly as long as education itself. The pictures here show that the change in the, the initial virus to COVID, um, what's new is that it mutated. It's not that a virus was, was new, it's just that it, the virus that did exist had mutated. The other difference was that um, our, our modes of understanding what's happening in the world, unlike back in the plague in 1665, is, is that modes of communication are certainly different. But what is the same is this. When the, when the Black Death struck Europe in the 14th century, killing off um, most of the population, if not half of the population, the University of Oxford, Oxford for example, responded by evacuating students to the country. And when it didn't end, they started developing more robust plans of how to have students gather um, in, in very displaced places, but still be able to maintain their education. Other pandemics like Britain's last major outbreak in 1666 had um, killed 7,000 Londoners in a single week. And because of that, King Charles II said, we have new rules now. We need no more public gathering, including funerals. Other nations have also responded to pandemics and viral issues uh, and biological warfare by wearing masks and prevention of additional exposure. So none of this really sounds different, does it? The difference is how we react and how we're getting information is different. How did we react? Well, initially we know what happened back in March. We were all given uh, initiatives and I do uh, instruct at a, a university locally and my nursing students now had to do things at a distance. I also had to learn how to do different things. Um, what we've also learned is that countries around the world have gone back to school. There is a website here that we'll share with you that shows how China, Denmark, Norway, Singapore, and Taiwan have responded um, themselves to new strategies of attendance, social distancing, uh, hygiene, and cleaning. We considered this reconstitution. So people wanted to get back to school like they are here, whether it's uh, in a hybrid format, online or in person, we really wanted to find a new sense of normal for a lot of different reasons. And Janine will get into this a little bit later, talking about social norms. But in order to reconstitute or get back to some semblance of normal, we had to provide some stakeholder trust. And that came through uh, an understanding and, uh, of, the, of the fact that we could provide in educational areas staff and student safety. Those of most most of those plans were backed up by uh, risk mitigation assessments and strategy and hopefully were research driven. And as the United States considers reopening more schools um, after the second wave that we're seeing now of the pandemic, policymakers and administrators, folks like ourselves need to really consider how can we assist um, folks reopen in a way that helps keep students and staff safe. So what is reconstitution? In the world of emergency management disaster planning, we have elements of what we call a viable continuity program or viable steps to maintain business. Um, it includes transitioning from a continuity state or an abnormal state to a new normal. And it, and it, and it describes coordinating and planning options for a new future state, outlining procedures to restore services, delivery and facilities. Steps to reconstitution are usually immediate, intermediate, and long-term. We've already seen some of the 
um, immediate and intermediate plans for business continuity? And what are their next steps? So for long term, we really need to say, okay, this is what we've done. This is what we've learned. Where are we going? Well, that's a big question. A lot of us don't necessarily have the answers, but we can certainly collaborate and ask the questions to each other. It's really important that we also understand that disaster preparedness and response um, is not linear. And all schools and business and public and federal health care uh, institutions that have had to respond are in this state of intermediate recovery. We're sort of in a quasi, can we, can't we, being driven by directives that come from a national level and a state level, um, as well as our own organizations and, and accreditation bodies. We know that schools have, reserved, like we said, resumed um, some, some sense of recovery, but where do we need to go next? We need to go to prevention and preparation for the next. And why do I say that? Is because recovering and building resiliency as we reopen schools has us uh, with a need to understand what else can happen. Um, we don't necessarily want to say that, but guess what? It's flu season. We're about to hit a change in seasons. We are in the middle of hurricane season. And when I talk about resiliency and I talk about um, reconstitution, I'm not talking just about pandemics so that you understand. Because pandemics are something that we, or even flu types of illness we've seen, not necessarily to this magnitude, but certainly have been in combination with other things that we've had to deal with, tsunamis, hurricanes, tornadoes. Um, and so we need to really keep all of this in mind. And, and what is our role um, in, in helping all of our educational um, clients and students become resilient? Well, understanding that resilience is uh, the capacity to withstand and recover from incident and adapt to sustain an acceptable level of social and economic function. This is really an important statement. Why? Because it really will be variable depending on where you are to what that acceptable level of social and economic function is. My goal within the Horde Couple Mock team is to help review school capacities, to help review gaps and opportunities to mitigate risk and prepare for disaster and be very unwavering in recovery. We need to help schools become resilient by being prepared so that they can be operationally and academically sound in any situation. We need to ensure that um, resilient organizations have all of the tools, technology, um, and opportunity that they, that they can to move forward. The methodology that I've used, and I'm just sharing this, is I try to combine a lot of other smart people's thoughts into how I do things. So my methodology has really involved the use of emergency management and pandemic um, preparedness considerations for reconstitution. The government, uh, Health and Human Services, really has some great um, resources that can be used to help prepare or at least assess our risk um, in, in operations now and, and in the event that something does happen. And I'll share those resources in the future. I use Lean Six Sigma for hazard analysis. As a Lean Six Sigma instructor, I think it's really important that we understand how to mitigate um, risk through uh, reducing waste and optimizing uh, the way we do business. We also use design thinking to get the right solutions. Lean principles, uh, anyone who's done lean in the past or hasn't done it simply means reducing waste. And we use lean principles to help keep student at the center of the value stream. Why are we doing this? Why is it important? It's a very methodical way for me to, how to, me to work with clients to help them understand how to go from where, you, where they are today to where they are going to in the future. It helps us really Look at, look at who they are, define their opportunities and challenges, put in some levels to measure whether or not what we're putting in the future can be, um, or is effective, pardon me, and ways to analyze whether or not they're effective. We use design thinking, and I say design thinking, um, it's a multidisciplinary approach to learn uh, client, the client itself and to analyze with research, um, research using the client's specific culture and capacity for change in mind. The design thinking, and, and this is why it's important with all of you on here, is really important that we have dialogue collectively to understand um, what is our current state of operations and educational inventory, both from a local level and a national level, and how can we help them define opportunities and challenges and what do they need for future sustainability. This is really important and it's usually um, a, a point in where I'm dealing with clients where I really want to make sure that it's culturally specific and specific to uh, the demographic that we're dealing with. Ideating a new future really involves aligning uh, best practices, strategic goals of, of an educational organization, and really developing an intentional program, not just a space, a space program, but an intentional operational program. And then testing that. So putting some of those into action, testing them to see whether or not they provide 
what I would hope to um, be is operational excellence for student experience and consumerism, regardless of where we are in, in, a, in a cycle of disaster or response. And then we really, it's really important that we test solutions, whether they're tabletop, whether they're through discussion and discovery, or whether or not they're, they're actions um, to help finalize the right solutions. But we have to remember that the approach to is, is cyclic. Remembering that we become resilient when we have true and tried plans and have considered all of the possibilities of disaster and all of the inimaginable things that can happen. And I, I say this because I've seen things that I never thought were imaginable in my past, both um, as a military officer and in my civilian work in healthcare. And so it's always important that even collectively we sit down and say, okay, what if, what if, what if, so that we have an opportunity to think about how we can help um, schools become highly reliable. And what that means is how can they be successful in averting disruption in services when disaster or unexpected events occur. We really saw really great things with the education um, uh, opportunities in some places, and I say in some because of some of my students didn't even have access to cell, cell service where they lived, but certainly opportunities to still maintain some level of education. In helping people re become resilient, we need to understand that it's important to prepare first. Unfortunately, in the case of, of COVID, we, we ended up with reconstituting, so it was reacting. And in reacting, we need, to, we need to understand that we have to have plans that are viable. And when I say viable, there's um, viable continuity elements that, that I like to, I'll go through these in, in great detail. But, where we are now at reconstitution, we need to think about what's next. We need to think about what's comprehensive. We need to think about what's inclusive. We need to think about um, all of the potential possibilities and developing all hazards plans. Operational endeavors to prepare for the worst things um, are, are better handled through risk mitigation and response planning. It's better to be proactive than reactive. It's better to be responsive uh, again than reactive. These types of plans I'll, I'll discuss, operation plans, emergency operations plans most schools already have that outline and prioritize and address response and recovery from all hazards, which include things like active shooters or bomb threats or violent uh, individuals. The emergency operations plan manages emergency events and helps with early recovery. Continuity of operations plans, however, is not all or nothing. It's an operational endeavor. It crosses the entire spectrum of an educational system. And these components that we'll talk about are really critical in ensuring that we have the appropriate infrastructure in place uh, in order for us to maintain continuity through disasters. So it's addressing issues in preparation for loss of things like loss of business functions, including IT, facilities, water, power. What about budget? Those are all things that we need to consider in the continuity of operations planning. All of our plans need to be comprehensive. They need to consider the pillars that we discussed about prevention, mitigation, preparation, and response. They need to be progressive. We need to be able to anticipate emergencies and disasters. We need to take preventative measures to build resilience. They need to be risk-driven. And by saying risk-driven, we really need to understand what are our hazards and be able to identify those. We need to understand how to um, uh, understand the impact if something was to happen. So for example, it may happen once in a lifetime, but that once in a lifetime thing may be absolutely detrimental to your business continuity versus something that may happen consistently, like our, our internet working, uh, not working, it's not necessarily um, life-threatening or, or detrimental, although it can be quite frustrating. They need to be integrated. And when I talk about integrated with schools is really important because we need to make sure that all levels of the continuum of education are understood and collectively discussing how things can happen, but also across the continuum of community, because most of our schools um, are more than just places of education. They're places where children eat. They're places where children feel safety and security. They're places where after school activities happen, um, sports happen, and they need to be collaborative. So we need to be able to create and sustain broad and sincere relationships to encourage trust, advocate a team atmosphere and build consensus to facilitate communication um, and, and effectiveness in our plans. I'm going to talk about the 10 elements of a viable continuity program and I ask that you think about your particular role in making these things happen or where you would fit in, in um, the devolution of these types of things. So the first one is essential functions. In order for us to say okay how can we maintain continuity in what we're doing we have to have 
elements of communication that are considered. So do we have the right infrastructure? Do we have the right equipment? Do we have the right technology? Do we have the right opportunity to share those links and, and um, communication networks with, with our stakeholders? Do we have resources and assets? And I say that because will our resources and ass assets be affected by our business continuity or what's happened as far as this pandemic? Have we defined everybody's responsibilities, roles, um, in the event that something does happen, whether it be pandemic, whether it be um, an active shooter, whether it be a tsunami, whether it be an earthquake, have we really considered those? Uh, what about the safety and security, not just for individuals, but for facilities and for campuses? What about utilities management? How will those utilities be managed if nobody can be on campus or nobody could be on site or if there's proponents of the utilities that have been damaged? And what do we need for student and staff support and activities to ensure that they have some level of, of normalcy and, and the ability to, to be able to resume normal functions? When I say essential functions and elements, we talk about this as being plans and procedures and mission essential functions. So you, what, what you absolutely need to reopen the doors. Orders of succession, also very important. We need to provide organized and predefined assumptions of who will do what, when, where, how. And I always say, please make this three deep. And the reason that I do that is because having lived through hurricanes on the Gulf Coast and having staff members that were managers and, and, and having teachers who were affected by um, the disaster itself, we needed to make sure that we had a second and a third option if those particular individuals weren't necessarily available. They should be developed to support day-to-day um, -day operations. Orders of succession, like I said, should be at least um, three people deep, but really a good opportunity to have somebody maybe not necessarily on the primary site. Delegations of authority. Do you have formal documents or do they have formal documents that specify the activities that can be performed by who? Who has authorization power? And who can act on behalf of the CEO, the provost, a principal, a department head? Um, even within your own organizations, think about, do you know who, would, who you would go to to have things um, answered in the event that there was a disruption? What type of internal documents do they maybe need to have in place? Policies, protocols, curriculum directives, uh, memorandums of understanding. I, I circle that one about 20 times because we really need to have some level of, of um, stakeholders um, and vendor involvement before something happens. So where can we go to for additional PPE ahead of time in the event that we need it? Or where can we go for water or refrigeration trucks or um, additional access? And so for example, in the university that I teach at here, we have a memorandum of understanding with a, with a uh, local hotel that we've taken over so that all of our uh, residents have now become privatized. And we also um, have leased a, a local restaurant so that we don't have to use, so we can have spatial distancing in our cafeterias. Continuity facilities. This is really an architectural, uh, real estate, uh, engineering, operational uh, activity to really think about what happens if our facilities that we're in are affected that we can't be there. So when I say um, this, I also think about it from a pandemic perspective is what if we can't offer health services right in our schools, then can we offer an alternative that's still on campus so that those children or their parents or whoever else can still ensure that the child is well and they can attend school or they can't and they should still be seen and, and provided access. We're seeing this um, in, in all sorts of realms, in, in all sorts of organizations. How else do we need to uh, be able to offer alternative real estate or alternative functions um, if they need to be relocated? Communication. We need to help our clients understand that they have to have backup resources. Do they have messages prepared? And so in communication, um, I think this is really important, especially with the reactivation of, of educational classes with COVID is, do we have communication boards, electronic or, or paper that really tell people where they, what they need to be doing and, and the rules of sort of, of the game? Do we have equipment available? And from an architecture and engineering perspective, have we considered space and have we considered infrastructure for backup equipment um, and storage of backup equipment? Do we have essential records? So essential records are categorized as emergency operation records required for essential functions during and after a continuity event. Um, these are usually legal documents of who's responsible, who's accountable, 
Um, there, and there are examples in the in the um, documents that, or the link to the documents that I can share, share at the end of things that you might need to consider. Human resources. This is really important, not just for ourselves, but you know, when, when we think about our clients across the continuum of education, what happens when their staff um, are affected by what's happening and how do they perform with reduced staffing? You know, one of the, one of the ways that we've looked at this in the past is can they put into, um, into place contracts for PRN or as needed staff so that when and if um, teachers can't be readily available that they do have options and opportunity in place ahead of time so that they're not struggling. Um, an emergency relocation group or personnel are usually a group of folks who are cross-trained to do several different things in the event that human resources are affected in a multitude of ways. Key component to continuity of operations planning is testing, training, and exercising. This is, this is only a drill, um, but those drills turn into reality pretty quick and they can happen in all sorts of different ways. You know, for example, even today before, our, before this um, conference, we wanted to make sure that our slides were up and running, our internet worked, that, um, that you could still see our slides, that, that things are really in place. And it's really important that we really test a lot of that stuff with our clients. So when we say, okay, now we're gonna reopen schools and we're going to have different alternative accesses. And now we're going to take everyone's temperature at the front door. We really need to test and see what that needs to look like moving forward and make sure that that's really aligned with um, what's required moving forward. Devolution of control and direction is how to have continued capacity offsite with alternative people and resources. And of course, we're seeing this in schools where if they don't necessarily have um, the, the appropriate resources on site, where else can it be offered? So we're seeing school being offered outside, we're seeing school being offered in um, at co-trailers to offer that social distancing. Um, and devolution plans are um, to ensure that we have capacity, even if personnel are unable to perform or, or the building's unable to perform. So it's really understanding um, where can they go? What el who else can be there? What other supplies are needed? How will they get moved? Those types of things. And reconstitution is where we're at. How do we transition from continuity status to normal operations? And what does normal mean? And right now, this is sort of what normal looks like. But I, I think that, and it might look like this for a long time, but I think it's really important to what does this look like when we have to combine it with other potentials? We really need to align procedures, new, um, new and for restored facilities. We need to help make sure that our clients have as much opportunity to consider the potentials in the future um, and those include things like doing a hazard vulnerability analysis, which provides a systematic approach to recognizing mitigating risk and doing a pandemic and all hazards preparedness act has outlined um, some of the requirements. It is public law and I have given, given you a, a resource to be able to go to this to look at some of your um, resources to understand how we can do this. I have the Joint Commission in here only because that's an accreditation body for healthcare, but it's certainly something that when you talk about emergency management disaster planning and you do have healthcare facilities or wellness facilities on your campuses for students. It's important for us to know that as well. These documents are um, federal government documents. There are addendums that uh, are in addition to these, but if you go to the websites, which I'll provide, um, you can certainly get some guidance. I think the last thing for continuity of operations planning for us is how do we help our clients help themselves? And what we found over the last um, several months with dealing with a lot of educational folks, healthcare folks, senior living folks is, how do we pay for it? How do we help them become prepared, but then how do they pay for it? And so what, they, what we need to understand is there is funding out there and the CARES Act or the Coronavirus Act Relief and um, Economic um, Security Act, pardon me, was passed by Congress in March, March 27th. It's earmarked several dollars for educational stabilization and moving forward. And it also includes opportunity and money that is earmarked for disaster preparedness and planning. Um, important to know that the law, the, the CARES um, Act money began flowing, at, but guess what? It stops in September 2022, as they say, so we need to make sure that it's spent. So let's help our clients um, understand how we can get them prepared and have access to this funding before that time. Um, the law also exists 12 allowable uses of the $13.2 billion in the package for the K-12 Relief Fund. It's really um, good to know that it's to provide principals and other school leaders with resources necessary to address the needs of their individual schools. And there's lots of money that, that's still out there that hasn't been spent. And so 
in my local community, for example, I've reached out to local authority folks to say, how can I help? And certainly if there's any direction that I can give you to, to either help you help your clients or to help you in your organizations itself, um, certainly let me know. Thank you so much for giving me the opportunity to be able to share some of my insight, obviously some of my passion about ensuring that we're prepared. Um, Janine will go into some of the real key reasons that we need to make sure that we have schools active and activated, or at least the resources that schools are providing, not just educational, but obviously the social supports and, and nutritional supports. So thank you so much. All right, thank you, Tracy. I'm gonna go ahead and share my screen. Okay. All right, hi everyone, thank you for having me and thank you to AIA Long Island, the BOCES folks and AIA Northern Virginia for putting this together. My name is Janine Katab. I also work with Tracy at Hort Copeland Macht in the greater DC area and I'm a learning environments designer. I have a particular interest in designing for safety, well-being, and community resiliency. I have devoted the last several years of my career to advocating for balance and holistic designs that can provide social emotional supports for schools while simultaneously enhancing school safety. I completed my graduate studies at MIT where I conducted research on schools and conflict zones, exploring the basic infrastructure required to ensure continuity of education despite daily threats to life. I'm happy to be here today with you all and to discuss school planning and design, especially six months after the start of COVID, the COVID-19 pandemic that brought our schools to a complete halt. What I found in my own research in conflict zones and what I've started to see in the last six months is that when communities are faced with true adversity, we discover parts of ourselves that we never knew before and education starts to mean something different. I'd like to use today's presentation to reflect on these past six months and attempt to interpret these new discoveries in order to explore possibilities for how we can improve our schools to be more resilient in the face of future challenges. I'd like to posit that new thinking requires brave conversations and hopefully today is just one of the many of first brave conversations that we all will continue to have. For today's talk, I'll start with a quick review of COVID-19 and where we're at today in terms of the pandemic. I'll then discuss efforts by the American Institute of Architects in June to assist with reopening plans in preparation for the fall and back to school. From there, I'll look at the emotional toll of the pandemic, especially if this re recovery phase lasts well beyond two years as we wait for a vaccine. Next, I'll explore new ways of thinking about learning and how we can depart from the building being just a place for shelter. And finally, I'll look towards healthy schools of the future. Starting with the global crisis. We were woefully unprepared for this pandemic, despite projections from health experts and epidemiologists for years that a pandemic would eventually hit us. What we're finding is that various underlying issues when simultaneously dealing with COVID-19 have only compounded to create a sprawling disaster. As of this past Sunday, the US ranked fifth globally in deaths per 100,000 people. We're struggling with a crashing economy, socioeconomic and racial inequity, inequitable food distribution, failing school infrastructure and pervasive isolation and anxiety. And as we look towards schools, we know that for decades, our schools have functioned as support centers, providing way more than just education. And still during this pandemic, even while students are at home, schools are providing social services that many youth, whether in urban or rural areas, don't have access to, things like internet, technology, or even food. Across the country when COVID-19 hit, 56.5 million students in elementary and secondary school were forced out of school. 3.7 million teachers struggling at home, many furloughed or even lost their jobs altogether. And 130,000 buildings that serve K-12 populations were forced to close. We know that schools are a vital lifeline and when they close, we all suffer. Schools can literally mean the difference between life or, life or death for some individuals. And it is critical that we work towards reopening our schools nationally. The first phase of planning for recovery was kind of like emergency triage. We needed to develop a plan with a backup plan and a backup plan to our backup plan, all within a matter of weeks to prepare for the fall when school would reopen. In June 2020, I was privileged enough to participate in a three-week virtual workshop organized by the American Institute of Architects. It was comprised of architects, public health experts, educators, building engineers from all across the country to plan for school reopening. Using a framework for risk mitigation called the hierarchy of controls, 
we focused our efforts on changes we could make to school infrastructure that would help limit the spread of the virus when schools would reopen to in-person learning. By the end of July, we would have published version 3.0 of our reoccupancy assessment tool. This guide would serve as a resource for building facilities, operations, and administrative personnel across the country and gather the best data from other regulatory, regulatory groups like ASHRAE and the CDC. Recommendations ranged from operational changes to infrastructural and even spatial. The ideas were anywhere from free to low cost and to higher upfront costs for more major upgrades. Any solutions provided in our guide would need to be integrated in a district-wide master plan that could be effectively applied in a systematic way. Additionally, the same way we think about security when dealing with intruders, we also conceptual, conceptualized a defense system to combat the spread of infection, where the first layer of defense would be to screen students and staff at the doors to stop symptomatic individuals before they enter the building. There are dozens and dozens of ideas that can be implemented. So the first step would be an evaluation of the condition of each building and a determination of what the baseline is and what upgrades would be necessary to meet minimum ventilation and plumbing requirements. Spatial distancing was especially challenging, specifically when classrooms across America are on average 800 square feet, which is fairly small, and serve 24 or more students. In order to meet the six foot spacing, student numbers would need to be cut in half or larger spaces in the school where students could be spread out would need to be adapted for classroom use. New challenges would begin to arise as we studied our options, acoustics, circulation paths, sanitizer stations, food distribution, and so on. Spatial configurations were explored extensively. Dozens of iterations from circles to squares to triangles attempted to maximize the number of students in a space while still maintaining some semblance of educational success. Outdoor learning seemed to be the easiest option, but come fall, Weather across the country would make outdoor classrooms nearly impossible as a universal solution. In a survey conducted of 477 schools by August 21st, nearly 50% of schools had planned to reopen fully in person. Of those, if we break down the analysis by geography, we see that schools in urban city areas predominantly planned to open with remote learning in place while rural school, schools were on the opposite end of the spectrum, 65% opening in person. This can be attributed to various reasons, the density in urban areas, making it nearly impossible to achieve spatial distancing minimums in classrooms, or in rural areas where wireless access points are not available everywhere and density is far less an issue, so a single school building can serve an entire population for miles. If we overlay demographic data based on poverty measurements, we see that 41% in the highest poverty quartile plan to start fully remote this year. That same quartile happens to overlap predominantly with schools located in urban areas. And furthermore, because of the complexity of building one or two plans, most schools that even had the capacity to develop a hybrid plan were those that were of the lowest poverty quartile. These charts depict that in-person and even hybrid learning are preferred but not accessible to all. And while virtual education has become a necessary choice for many schools, unfortunately, studies are predicting that absenteeism is on the rise and there will be significant widening, um, widening gaps in education across socioeconomic divides. Another reason why returning to in-person learning has been such a challenge is due to our failing school infrastructure. Our building, our building stock has a shelf life and many schools built in the 50s and 60s have not been properly maintained or upgraded over time. In a study of over 200 schools conducted over a 10 year period by the EPA, researchers found that only 20% of the survey pool met minimum ventilation requirements recommended by ASHRAE. It is critical then that as we take steps today to respond to COVID-19, that we don't react quickly, but rather we invest strategically. We should consider what our highest priority goals are and evaluate the timelines in which we need to achieve them. Health experts have started to indicate that while a vaccine could be on the horizon, the first in line will be the elderly to receive it. Children will likely be the last ones to receive the vaccine, which, which some speculate could be anywhere from two to three years from now. And while children may not be the prime carriers or the most vulnerable to COVID-19, Others within our schools, our teachers and staff, the parents who drop off and pick up kids are put at risk every day. 
While we plan for the long haul, we know that it is critical that students continue to learn, whether it's in a school setting, at home, or virtually. Continuity of education is important, and we risk an entire generation of learners falling behind. But if this recovery phase will last for years, how can we start to emotionally and mentally prepare for the challenge ahead, especially when going to school every day engulfed in fear can start to become debilitating? The first six months of the pandemic have brought to fore new knowledge and awareness of our society's coping, coping mechanisms at large. Behavioral psychology can assist us in understanding how and why society makes certain choices during the pandemic. Scientist and professor Jay Ben Babel of NYU describes various reasons for why people behave certain ways, cultural context being one, where different cultural norms can influence the way we behave. We are inherently an individualistic society. We value our liberties and freedom and at times prioritize our own needs over the needs of many. And yet, despite that, we rely heavily on relationships and human contact. Our bodies and minds are literally built for connection and the pandemic goes against our natural instincts. This is why we see parties, weddings, gatherings, because people have a hard time resisting the tendency for human connection. Another behavioral pat pattern is optimism bias. We have a tendency to be optimistic and to see the glass half full. This can be extremely important when we are faced with long-term challenges because it speaks to our human spirit, but can also mean that in the face of a pandemic, we may be prone to taking dangerous risks. And finally, Van Babel speaks to the speed of change. Our habits and behaviors are deeply ingrained in us and will take a long time to change. So getting compliance with new policies will be difficult and even more so in a school system that is large and will take time to change course. Continuing school in the face of, of a pandemic where life and death are just one sneeze away requires us to be in a constant state of survival, especially for in-person learning. We must always be aware of our surroundings, fearful that we may have forgotten to wash our hands or that we're sitting a little too close to someone. And for remote learners struggling with isolation or frustrations with lack of participation and inability to concentrate and even hardships for parents who are acting as teachers and working simultaneously. It is important that we tackle the potential for chronic stress and get ahead of it. We must plan for ways to integrate safety, both from an environmental as well as socio social emotional perspective. If we cannot fulfill an individual's need for feeling safe, then we will start to see ongoing degradation of educational success and achievement, and even worse, heightened levels of depression and other, other physical illnesses. We must lay the foundations for resilience now, even in the midst of recovery. Harvard University Center on Developing the Child outlines a roadmap for building resilience. It is important to note that resilience is not something that we are born with, but rather it is built over time. Imagine a scale. On one side, we have our many challenges weighing us down, and on the other, we have positive stability. The goal in building resilience is to start to tip the scale towards the positive. In phase one, we begin by unloading our negative sources of stress. During the pandemic, these are our emergency responses, schools providing food, access to internet, individuals applying for financial assistance, and additionally, finding time for self-care. We start to see the scale slightly tip. In phase two, we seek out and establish supportive and responsive relationships to continue moving in a positive direction. This is particularly important to note, especially when spatial distancing has been defined as one of the primary mechanisms and controls for mitigating the spread of the virus. We need to shift our language and our mindset away from social distancing and emphasize the spatial aspect of this change. We must focus on those human connections and get back to the message of the behavioral psychologists. Can we creatively find opportunities for human connections in classrooms while still keeping students apart? And finally, in phase three, we must focus on strengthening core life skills. For adults, for example, at an individual level, these are things like budget planning and investing in one's higher education, but we can also interpret this at a systems-wide level. We must think about our long-term investments in our students, communities, and schools. Investing in our cities so that we eradicate homelessness, food deserts, broken families, and even poverty. All of these investments in our society at large can help to lessen the load on our school systems and bring back the focus to education and developing the whole child. Building resilience and surviving this pandemic will require that we work together and prioritize our collective health. So what does all of this mean for our schools? 
School buildings have for so long been described as an oasis, a beacon for communities, and an escape from our daily lives. In the midst of a pandemic, a disaster, or any major life threat, really, education can give our students hope and something to work towards. We need that hope to cling to, and therefore continuity of education is a critical part of our survival. In a matter of months, we watched schools across the country reopen. Opening looked different this year, with some in-person and some and physical modifications to the school, some remote and teachers being the heroes that they are, literally getting PhDs overnight in virtual education and even outdoor learning. For many, this latter solution also brings years of advocating for biophilic learning environments to the fore. It's really fascinating to see that the natural environment is one of the resources that's helped us to heal the most during this difficult time, while our schools were no longer the oases we relied on for so long. Beyond institutionalized planning, we watched parents and communities develop their own solutions. Pandemic pods and micro schools employ teachers that rotate with small cohorts of students to teach them in alternate settings outside of school. Backyards, living rooms, and cultural centers all became homes to rotating learning environments. And yet this innovation is not without issues. Only the most privileged have been able to afford opting into these programs, essentially lending, lending to the widening of education gaps across socioeconomic divides. Teachers are being poached from schools, union agreements are being undermined. Mothers are overburdened, still required to work and also expected to support in the teaching. And without certain controls in place, these pods could be breeding grounds for spreading the virus. While some individual schools have looked into partnering with these groups, school districts cannot really get behind them because they ultimately undermine the public school commitment to no child left behind. But can we find ways to adapt these ad hoc solutions? Can we take the good and leave the bad? Whether it be online learning, outdoor learning, pandemic pods, our society's ability to think creatively and to adapt in these challenging times is profound. I often reflect on my time abroad where I had the opportunity to conduct research in refugee camps and work with students and staff in schools on the front lines of a conflict zone. Similar to these rotating pandemic pods, I observed in my research that when war and destruction made schools inaccessible, families rotated schools in their homes, ensuring that students still had the opportunity to learn. And when school was available, Students and faculty would risk their lives day in, day out, walk to school, risk the chance of being shot, or have to face the visuals of tanks on a daily basis. In one conversation with a school principal, uh, we were standing on the roof of his building and he pointed out to the skyline, explaining to me that despite their lived trauma, it was important to visualize and see the potential for a life filled with opportunity. Uh, it was then and there that you know, my, my beliefs were confirmed that standardized exams and book reports uh, are, are not the, the sole purpose of school. It was a human right, really. And so just as we see societies across the world today work towards recovery, we can also observe their ingenuity and creativity. In a speculative exercise, we can attempt to diagram these new ad hoc models of learning that appeared during COVID and utilize, and utilize a spatial lens. Let's start with the traditional diagram of a school system where the school system acts as an umbrella. The community is connected within that system and provides support. A school building provides local management of a single school population. And finally, at the smallest level is the classroom at the center of these concentric rings and is the child's learning space. It is traditionally protected, it is structured, and it is predictable. If we take a step back and look at a macro level, we start to see that our society is filled with many of these systems and districts. These systems can be interpreted as disparate entities, geographically, generationally, socially, racially, and so on. They typically function as independent silos, varied in scale, sometimes interacting, but really remaining mostly isolated. Furthermore, these silos are reinforced by district and operational boundary lines, where each school system has access to finite resources some systems have access to more resources and others less. Resources can be things like access to parks, healthy food options, safe infrastructure, and so on. What we saw during COVID-19 was a breakdown of these centralized systems and the emergence of new organic networks. In some districts, ties back to the school were still critical, where school buildings and systems now became food distribution centers 
or served stu students with wireless access points in parking lots. Additionally, new nodes started to appear, virtual learning spaces, pandemic, pandemic pods, outdoor classrooms, connecting us beyond the local community level and giving us the potential to tap into resources across the country or even the globe. These new synapses show that where a child's space can exist remotely from the school, it must still rely on the community for support. Where the school was once a childcare facility, acting as an in situ parents day in and day out, the role of family came to the fore as being critical for child and student survival. However, not every child has a supportive family or community structure they can rely on, leaving many kids without a safe environment to live, let alone learn. Therefore, our school systems prioritize the most vulnerable students in our society. If 12 seats out of 24 are available in a classroom, then students who needed the seat the most were given first priority to opt in for in-person learning. It became our collective responsibility to uplift each child, whether they had a learning disability, an essential worker parent who was not available at home, or any other myriad of challenges. So what can we take from this spatial diagrammatic exercise? Schools are part of a social system and they are intertwined with every aspect of life. We must find a way to build resilience knowing that the whole is only as strong as the sum of its parts. Districts should explore resource sharing across boundaries to promote greater socioeconomic equity. A child's learning space inherently exists beyond a school building. Flexible and non-insular designs of buildings can lend to experiential learning and can improve environmental literacy. And finally, communities and schools must work together in a symbiotic and harmonious way. Institutions should find ways to incorporate community voice towards positive and innovative development. Before today's session, registrants were invited to participate in a survey and contribute thoughts on the future of school design. 40 participants provided answers. This chart depicts the total number of thoughts organized by theme. The three highest considerations were infrastructural changes, spatial consideration, and new learning models, while issues like financial considerations and impacts to construction lagged behind. While budget and policy are two very real constraints that we must grapple with, uh, it's very fascinating that this group is still inspired, is hopeful, and is looking for new ways to be innovative. So for the folks who responded and for the other folks who are listening in today, uh, you guys are all the leaders um, in this industry across Long Island and the greater DC area. So it's up to folks in this group and other similar minded people to challenge the status quo and plan for a more resilient future. Future thinking means cross-disciplinary dialogue, breaking down those silos. It means we need to reevaluate our priorities and define the scope of public education for generations to come. Uh, we need to explore new, new learning models and pedagogies that are not a one size fits all and rather are organic and malleable. Human centered design must come to the fore uh, public health, wellness, equity, and resilience, those are important factors. And finally, school buildings must be flexible, agile, and responsive to a rapidly changing world. I'd like to finish my presentation with a series of uplifting images reminding us of what healthy schools can and do look like and what we're missing while many of us are stuck at home. We must design high-performing schools. Uh, studies have shown that this improves achievements, physical health, and can improve a child's sense of safety. We must integrate outdoor spaces in our design. We must rise up, build vertically, and look towards adaptive reuse, especially as we struggle with trying to reduce density. We need to incorporate flexible, large, open spaces that exist beyond the classroom walls. We need community resources inside and outside of our buildings that are open to the public and can be shared to promote equity. We must disperse our adult access throughout our buildings. We can try to apply that decentralized system at a smaller scale within the building proper. We need to diversify types of learning environments inside and outside of our schools 
Studies show that this can help to foster critical thinking, creativity, and improve human connections. We can also look at the spaces in between and adjacent to our buildings that are operated by other municipal groups. Parks, civic, and cultural centers are opportunities for partnership and can help instill civic, historic, and cultural pride. We must truly invest in our school infrastructure to build more sustainable environments and communities to help ensure stability and resiliency. Ultimately, we've made so much progress over the past few years with school design, and we really don't want to undo that. So we need to think strategically moving forward, tap into our collective unrealized potential, and strive to impact positive sustainable change. Thank you. Thank you so much, uh, Tracy and Janine, for a great presentation. And thank you for sharing with us all the research work that you have both uh, done regarding resiliency, safety, and in schools planning and design. Uh, we have a couple of minutes for questions. I see that two people uh, raised their hands, so I'm not sure if maybe they are not able to type in the question. I could just allow them to talk if they can. I know Roman, you have a you have a question. Okay, he's mute. Okay, no, it's not it's not working. His uh his sound. Tony, you had a question? Yeah, just um Janine, um, what what types of you were talking about? Um, you know, using our communities. Uh, what types of indoor and outdoor spaces um, in our communities do you see as maybe potential uh, learning environments outside the physical school, school buildings? Where where can we go? I mean, I know we have work to do in our buildings, but that's uh, you know another alternative is to you know uh, work with the communities. Yeah. So part of my conversation was that we need to recognize that learning can happen anywhere and it does happen anywhere already. The students are like sponges, they're absorbing everything around them, whether it's at home, on their journey to school. So I think the first part for learners and educators is trying to reckon with that and you know, how do we support students in kind of being the scaffolding for them to be able to interpret their, their environments. But beyond that, if we wanna be purposeful, you know, field trips have always existed but we can start to really look at occupying other types of spaces and developing partnerships, uh, libraries, museums, art galleries, um, you know, even third places like coffee shops. Uh, while those might seem kind of not normal or kind of out there, uh, students are already intersecting and, and walking through those spaces. Um, also outdoors, you know, public parks, federal parks, uh, we can develop partnerships with these types of institutions and start to utilize those spaces in more meaningful and, and purposeful ways. I know the Arboretum here in Virginia has actually um, offered some, f some additional space for adult learning, so that's potential too for additional K-12 potentially. Yeah, yeah. I mean, we've been talking about lifelong learning for a really long time. This isn't, you know, none of this is new. I think what it is is just about kind of pivoting that our thinking and starting to um, explore other opportunities and being more creative in how we utilize our broader environments. We have another question here. As school security is always of paramount concern in our planning before this pandemic, how can a school balance and integrate security when using outdoor, even public spaces? Mm -hmm. Yeah, it's definitely a challenge. And, you know, we, uh, Tracy talked a lot about um, planning for various types of, of threats that can exist. Um, it's almost like, you know, what's your, your one, your five year storm, 100 year storm, and planning for those various types of, of disasters. Mm -hmm. So if there is a threat like an active shooter, 
um, or if there are threats like pandemics. This pandemic occurred 10 years after we had an economic crisis. Um, so are pandemics going to be on a 10-year cycle? I don't know. But what we need to understand is that we can't solve every threat simultaneously all the time. And every threat is not equal. They, there are varied degrees of threats. Um, so outdoor learning is something that, while can be scary for many, uh, we could be strategic about um, how we tier protection. So we can look at the boundaries, starting perhaps with a fence um, or some sort of, you know, if the, the outdoor environment is internal to a courtyard in the building, we can build tiered structures of, of security and safety and, and really build those defensible uh, spaces from, you know, the kind of most uh, outer uh, ring of, of a concentric circle model. I think with, with safety and security is site access as well. So it's really being deliberate about where folks can enter and, and exit. Um, it's also opportunities with some of the outdoor learning is outdoor security cameras. So somebody can still be visual, um, seeing the global big picture while other people are, are you know, central, centralized and focused on their actual learning. Um, safety and security comes from a lot of different modalities and, and it really depends on what type of outdoor space that you're talking about. Um, but those are some of the things that, that if you have additional questions, I can certainly explore that with you. Mm -hmm. Thank you. Susan is asking, are there discussions, especially in the urban areas, for repurposing office business spaces that may no longer be useful in the post-COVID world? Yeah, one of the, the pictures I put up uh, is a project that we did in Alexandria, Virginia. It's the Ferdinand T. Day School. And that was a renovation of an existing office building that was turned into a school. Uh, the playground is actually on the roof of the, the parking garage for that, for that school community. So there are a, really creative ways that we can look towards adaptive reuse and start to, um, you know, salvage a lot of the existing infrastructure that we have across the city. I don't know what the future of offices is going to be moving forward, especially as we start to utilize, um, you know, the virtual tools that we have more moving forward. So if businesses are starting to see a shift in their future operations, that could be something that is a resource for schools uh, and we can, you know, architects can support in those endeavors. So Janine, an example here that Shenandoah University has actually leased a, a local restaurant that they're using not just to offer additional um, uh, food services, but also because the booths offer an opportunity for uh, individuals to be able to sort of be separated from one another for learning. So those are other opportunities as we see businesses, unfortunately, um, you know, not not survivable during during COVID that they do have the internal resources with tables and chairs and some levels of separation. Mm -hmm. Yeah. So Caps Capser is um, commenting, there have been some really innovative school projects. The smaller local schools need this as well. A hundred percent. I mean, we really have to be pushing the envelope now and thinking creatively. People keep saying and asking, when can we return to the way things used to be? And I'm, you know, I ask back, do we want it to return to the way things used to be? Um, that's what led us to this disaster. Uh, and, you know, the conflation of all of these, um, you know, issues at the same time really led to our own demise. So we need to be taking this as an opportunity to think better and, and innovative and more creatively. Mary M, have school districts planning departments reach out to you and are you actively working with them to pilot some of these unconventional learning spaces since start of COVID? Yeah, we've definitely spoken with a lot of different school districts, uh, you know, across, across the country. Uh, and every school district's at a different place. They have different resources, whether it's private school, public school, independent school, even at the university level, we're really talking to all of our different client groups. And each client group has a different organization and a different structure. So there is no one size fits all solution, but we are seeing some folks who are interested in, in more creative, uh, creative options. But, you know, the conversation that I was, uh, you know, kind of posing earlier about new systems and thinking about new community connections 
really has yet to happen at an institutional level. So I'm hoping that with conversations like this and these types of um, you know, engagements that architects and uh, educators can start to really you know, work together and cross pollinate and be a bit brave to have these challenging conversations. Uh, we're starting to see RFPs change that are coming out for new projects where um, you know, architecture firms and you know, their, their engineering partners are not the only people that are gonna be on a project team. Um, you know, there could be project members that are you know, community health experts that focus on public health, like Tracy Graham. She it comes from a public health background and she's working inside of an architecture firm. So breaking down those types of um, silos and buckets that we've placed ourselves in uh, across organizations is what's going to really push us to that next level of creative thinking. And I think we really have to integrate wellness and health into our, you know, into our thought process of how we're educating children. Mm -hmm. We got another very interesting question. With future COVID school designing, are you in a position where you can share templates or links with checklists for smart future designs that we can utilize as we plan and discuss with stakeholders and architects, engineers, et cetera? Yeah, you know, there are things that we can share. Um, architects tend to kind of move away from boiler template probably um, ideas and solutions because at the end of the day it comes down to who that community is that we're serving sure. and every community has their own goals and um, you know ideals for what's critical for them and we want the built environment to be aligned with each community's desires and goals for themselves um, not really kind of creating these boiler template solutions that will most likely end up failing, um, you know, in the short term and maybe long term. It's sort of what we talked about with design thinking that to get to the right solution for individual clients, we really have to do due diligence and discovery of who they are and, and not only what they're looking to solve, but what they have the capacity to do in solving those issues. So although you can have a checklist, like I always say to to sort of be compliant or to try something new, I think it's it's probably far greater and far more important to to seek that discovery and really understand what the clients want to do um, sort of and what is their why and what do they have the capacity to be able to do. Thank you. Uh, Maury Sanders, she's asking, I see these planning and design recommendations to extend well beyond the establishment of a vaccine. Do you see any reason why this will not be the new standard for school and community design? Tracy, you want to... <laughs> hi, hi, Maury. Nice to have you here. Go ahead, Tracy. So, so if I'm understanding the question, it's it's why would we why would we sort of stay the way we are versus moving to something different, or why are we going to continue to move to something different rather than stay with the way we are? And I think again, that's going to be really culturally dependent. So I think in in some areas, for instance, in the school district that I see here during the COVID um, crisis. You know, we, we did a lot of volunteering to deliver meals to, to folks. And so when you see that there's such a great dependence for a school system the way it is now to be the way they want it to be in the future will really be dependent on, on the individuals where you also see um, educational institutions and, and communities who said, heck, like, why would we want to go back? Why would we want to do things the way we used to? It's cheaper, it's easier, it's more convenient to be offering things online. Um, again, it's, it's about doing that due diligence and, and seeing what the sort of guiding principles and guiding requirements are for that particular either institution or community. And ensuring that, again, I say this with whether it's you're designing a school, you're designing a clinic, or you're designing anything, it's we have to be able to design to, to, to what they need to be able to accomplish in the end, but also what they have the cap capacity to accomplish. Mm -hmm. So by saying, yeah, we want to be able to offer um, outdoor classrooms and we want to offer extended, um, you know, opportunities with, a, you know, electronic signage and everything else. Can people really afford that? And is it really even necessary in certain, in certain educational environments? And so I think it's, again, I think it's our responsibility to ask the right questions. I don't necessarily have any cookie cutter answer and I, and I would hope that other people wouldn't either um, because every answer is going to be different. I mean, I, 
come from a from a background in northern Canada where I have children who are or foster children who are living in indigenous communities and they're actually teaching children in teepees up north right now during the fall season and integrating different lifestyle things than they normally would have taught in, in a school environment and what they're finding is is that they're actually excelling because it's different rather than putting them in a box and saying this is the way you need to learn and you need to follow this curriculum so I think we just need to do dil due diligence and, and be responsible that way. Yeah, I think the other part of Maury's question was so much of what we're talking about today is really beyond the bounds of what schools are even capable of, of touching. And I think that that is so critical to acknowledge. Schools cannot, and you know, I don't know if they even should, try to basically be the catch-all for all of the issues and ailments that our society is suffering from. Um, if we have food deserts, if we've got issues like homelessness um, or broken families, schools have such a burden on them to try to resolve and support students through all of that. Um, and, and it really does take away from the success of the learning at the end of the day. So I think a process of prioritization is going to be critical moving forward, but also collaboration with you know, local leaders politicians, um, you know, advocacy, effort, uh, advocacy groups, nonprofits, um, and trying to work with them to think about how we heal our cities and our rural, rural places and our suburbs um, and start there as well. So it's got to be a holistic solution. You know, in, in touching on that comment, Janine, I think one of the important things we had this discussion the other day is even when we start looking at um, multi-use housing and how they're integrating educational spaces in into the new multi-generational and multi-use housing spaces. Why? Because parents are still having to stay at home or parents are still having to go to work and they need alternate um, adults there to be able to support children in their learning. And so these multi-dimensional housing units are now being designed and developed so that collective learning can happen with children with alternate adults being there at different times. So it's, it's looking outside of the, the typical normal school environment and, and where does the education need to have to happen and how does it need to have to happen and what is the end result in it having to happen? Yeah, for so often, for so long, you know, architects and educators have talked about the importance of mentorship at across age groups. And during COVID, you've got students studying at home with all of their different siblings. And it's really interesting when you see the multi-generational, cross-generational um, overlap uh, within one household. And, you know, can that be mimicked at an institutional level in different ways? And can we start to break down the building and how the building is organized, not necessarily by classroom age group, but perhaps by different themes, perhaps different mechanisms of, of ideology and, and pedagogy. So um, how a building is laid out can also be considered in different ways. For sure. And, and, I, and I shared with Janine the other day that in grade five and six, when I moved back to a small town in Manitoba, um, I went to a one room school. And so in that one room school, I had lots of opportunity to learn not what to do, <laughs> but also what to do um, and also had, you know, mentorship from, from my, my town, town sort of friends and, and teammates who are a little bit older than I was to help me guide, them, guide me through math and science and, and English in a different way. And, and I thought that that was really interesting learning. And it, at the time I thought, well, this is, I can't wait to get to a big school with our own classroom and hang out with our own friends. But in, in, you know, in retrospect, you look back and you think, wow, what an opportunity. Um, and maybe, like you said, we need to we need to think about is that is that a new norm for maybe smaller communities or or small spaces within cities, urban areas? Yeah, definitely. We're running out of time, but I think I'm I have just a few minutes just for a last question uh, that Michael Mark just posted. What code changes do you think that we will see to react to pandemics, spe specifically in the areas of ventilation and school nurse facilities? Um, so, you know, it's still early to say what kind of code changes we can expect to see. Uh, I know that in terms of occupancy count, we're having to analyze, uh, you know, different occupancy. So there could be changes in, you know, what is constituted as, um, you know, occupancy count per different types of classrooms. So that could potentially change moving forward. Um, you know, ventilation requirements. 
they might advance and push forward. We do see ASHRAE update its, its documents and its guidelines, um, you know, not often, but, uh, you know, kind of within reason every time there's a big um, change like this. So, it, you know, potentially we could see some advancement there. But, you know, regardless, we've got so many of these existing buildings, even if we do see ASHRAE push forward and change vent ventilation guidelines, if we can't get our HVAC systems in the existing buildings up to an appropriate level, um, it's kind of a moot point. So we need to think about not just new construction, but additionally our existing facilities as well. Maybe awesome. Tracy, if you want to talk to the nursing. Um, yeah, so, so two things with that. One, when we talk about the ventilation, I think it's going to be really critical to look back at a lot of the research, especially in schools in Europe that, are, that don't have the HVAC systems that we do and they've opened the window. Um, and how has that made a difference? And so one of the resources um, and links that I had on my presentation speaks to how some of those schools um, you know, have dealt with the pandemic by dealing with the, the HVAC systems they have. I think from a nursing perspective, I think the level of, of understanding and accountability is going to have to change. I think the expectation, like Janine said, is we've relied on schools to have somebody on site to be able to sort of be the wellness, the wellness gatekeeper um, for children in schools, when in fact, should that be their responsibility in the first place? So yes, I think there's opportunity that, that schools may change. One of the pictures that I had is offering that uh, on the campus, but not in the school so that if anyone is potentially infectious, they don't even enter the school. But secondly, um, we have to start thinking about moving forward with the roles and responsibilities and accountability and liability that come with that, um, that role. What does that look like from a nursing perspective? And I know being in advanced practice, nurse for many years, it's, it's something that we're looking at from a licensure perspective and the risk of being in that position. And, um, and, and I often say this, just because you have a fever doesn't mean you're sick. And so by taking everyone's temperature has, has really been a controversial issue because some people run a higher temperature or some people run a lower temperature or some people who may have a ruptured appendix have a temperature, but they're not infectious. So we really have to be cognizant of, of what that's going to look like. And, and again, the roles and responsibilities and where we're educating children and how they're going to be educated and whether or not that role needs to either stay or leave within the schools. So I think it's, it's yet to be seen. Um, I hear a lot of things from licensure boards that are saying, why are we there in the first place? Um, and, and if we're going to be there, should it be on the campus, but not within the same environment or the same, the same walls, potentially? Does that answer your question? Yes. <laughs> well, thank you so much, Tracy and Janine. Uh, we still have three questions that we will reply in writing. Like I said before, we're going to be posting this uh, webinar online along with the questions. So just wait for maybe a week or so, so we have those completed. And now, Tony, uh, would you like to close the session? Sure, thank you, Graciela. Um, so that concludes our webinar presentation. Uh, but before we end today's session, uh, first, a very special thank you to our speakers, Tracy Graham and Janine Katab, for uh, an excellent and a very informative uh, presentation on such an important topic. So thank you both very much. Uh, thanks as well to our sign interpreter, Nicole O'Donnell, who did a great job today. Appreciate that. Um, thank you to Dr. Christina Coughlin for joining us, sharing her thoughts and her opening remarks. Uh, you know, so much went into and continues to go into the planning of this webinar series. So uh, I, I would like to thank our NASA uh, BOCES District Superintendent, Dr. Robert Dillon, as well as our NASA BOCES Board and our Communications Office for their strong support throughout uh, this initiative. Um, I thank the, uh, the Thought Exchange team. Um, I thank our co-hosts, AIA from Northern Virginia, uh, and Joseph McCoy for their help and their uh, participation. And thank you, of course, to everyone at AA Long Island and, and Graciela Carrillo for all the hard work and assistance you provided in planning for this webinar series. But lastly, I would especially like to thank all of you for taking time out of your busy schedules to be part of this webinar today. Um, you all play such a critical role in driving this important discussion so to continue the conversation, we are following up today's session with another thought exchange question to get each of your thoughts on your experience and your takeaways today. Um, and that question will be sent out to each of you shortly. Uh, we'd also like to invite all of you back to join us for the next webinar in the series, and it's a, 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 in a three-part series, scheduled two weeks from today on October 14th. 
from 12 noon to 1.30 p.m. It's titled Next Millennium Design, Adapting to Emerging Variables. The third webinar is scheduled for October 28th, two weeks after that, at the same time. And that webinar will be titled Transforming School Design for a Post-COVID World, Learning Spaces for Creativity and Collaboration. So please mark your calendars for both events. We'll be sending out a, a program announcement for the second webinar before the end of this week. The third announcement will follow up in a, in a couple of weeks. So thanks again to all of you and be well. Hope to see you soon and take care everyone. Thank you again. Thank you. Thank you everyone. Great presentation, Janine and Tracy. Thank you. Bye guys. Have a nice week, everybody. Enjoy. Bye.